So now in this last flow chart uh, on the Hardy-Weinberg assumptions, uh, we're going to be now finally concluding our look at the Hardy-Weinberg idea by looking at the two last components that are important when studying microevolution. And microevolution in and of itself is just looking at the idea of Hardy-Weinberg and the deviation from it. And we're going to get to that as we move forward. So we're on the title of this next flow chart, um, Hardy-Weinberg conditions. And this will be Hardy-Weinberg conditions one, two, three. Last one for the conditions. Um, if we remember the conditions, we have gone over natural selection is not necessary. We cannot have mutations. We've talked about the idea of having very, very large populations. Um, and we are now going to conclude our discussion by looking at the idea of genetic drift and gene flow. Okay, so let's let's look at these two things. We'll do genetic drift first. Okay, genetic drift is a big idea that we're going to look at starting now. So, genetic drift. Genetic drift is going to be defined as the following. So we'll do a basic definition on the side here. The definition is that there is going to be a production of random evolutionary changes. Okay, The production of random evo, standing for evolutionary changes in what we would consider small, and that's the key idea here, small populations. Okay. The two things I always tell everybody about genetic drift is that genetic drift has to happen randomly and it has to be within a small population that is breeding, that is uh, creating more individuals. So the production of random evolutionary changes in small populations. Genetic drift, random and small. Keep those two ideas in mind. Now, hopefully you, being the curious individual that you are, are wondering, well, why? Why small populations of all things do we need for genetic drift? So let's ask ourselves that. Why small populations? What is the purpose of using small populations in a Hardy-Weinberg condition that asks for large populations? Well, the reason why we want large populations is because we don't want genetic drift to happen. And genetic drift happens in small populations. And in order for us to have a perfect Hardy-Weinberg situation, we need a large population to avoid genetic drift altogether. But why the re requirement of small populations? Well, it's very simple. It's the idea of probability, honestly. The idea that a random event can indeed, in a small population, it has to be a small population, a random event can indeed change allele frequencies, okay? Can it change allele frequencies? Go back to the definition of microevolution, go back to the definition of genetic equilibrium, and notice that we're now actually changing allele frequencies. Let me give you two basic examples to really drive home this idea that small populations are a bad, bad thing in something like a Hardy-Weinberg scenario. So let me give you example one. Example one is quite simple. We have 10 plants. Okay, imagine we have 10 plants, uh, this population of 10 plants, and that population of 10 plants has uh, within it five red plants and five white plants. Same idea and example that we're going over, same idea with the alleles and whatever. Not even necessary right now to talk about. Let's switch it up a bit and say I have a random event, a random event that's going to influence my relatively small population of 10 plants. That random event will be a cow walks by, a cow, yes, a cow walks by and randomly eats uh, a three at random. Okay, cow eats three at random. Is that a random event? That is a random event. The cow can choose three at random. It's not going to have a preference in this made-up situation. I'm telling you that they randomly eat three of the plants. And, oh, look what happened. All three that they ate, this cow ate, they were all red. Okay? cow eats three at random, they end up being all red. You know what has just happened? You have just caused a drastic, there has been a huge, huge change in what? 
You have eliminated three red plants from this population of 10. You have thus created a drastic change in allele frequency because the population is so small that eating three red plants that no longer have the opportunity to pass on their red plant genes is going to cause a drastic change in allele frequency. That is a small population. That is genetic drift happening on a small population. The genes are drifting towards being white, right? Or the genes of red are drifting away because of this drastic change in allele frequency due to Mr. Cow over here. Okay, well then let's ask ourselves, well, why does Hardy Weinberg want a large population? This is very, very simple. Imagine now in this random event probability idea, let's change it to 1,000 plants. And of these 1,000 plants, I have 500 red and 500 white, right? Right now over here at a 50-50 allele frequency, right? And now I'm going to change it so that I lose three out of the red, so out of the five red. So now I have five white versus two red. Now my allele frequency is five out of seven versus two out of seven. Before it was five out of 10 versus five out of 10.5.5. .5. That is absolutely a drastic change. What if I do the same scenario right over here? What if my cow that walks by comes in and the cow again eats three at random, and the number is still three. This is our genetic drift scenario. All three are red, okay? All three are red. You know what happens in this situation? Literally nothing. You have a very small, small, tiny effect out of this. You still are relatively going to be, the relative allele frequency, let's say, will still be around 0.5 red, 0.5 white, plus or minus, you know, very small percentage. This is why small populations are absolutely necessary in a random change, okay? In a random evolutionary change in a small population. Is there going to be an evolutionary change? Of course there is. The evolutionary change will gear towards these white plants because there's just going to be more of them. There's going to be a change in the allele frequency that will favor white plants so much more so because of this genetic drift event that just happened. Now, in reality, what we notice is that most normal populations, aka most populations in nature, are relatively large. Okay, Most normal populations are relatively large, and thus GD, or genetic drift, has little to no effect on most populations. Okay, There are examples, you can look in your textbook, of real-life genetic drift having an effect on a population, but in most reality, genetic drift, just like in this Hardy-Weinberg cooked-up scenario, um, Genetic drift has very little effect, okay? And uh, lastly, in terms of genetic drift, there are two types of genetic drift to understand, two types of drift. And those two types of drifts are the following. Uh, you just need to know these, be familiar with their definitions and what they mean. One of them is called the founder's effect. The founder's effect is the following. It's when you have um, a few individuals colonize a new habitat, Okay, few individuals, few colonize new habitat. Why did I say few? Well, what happened was a big storm happened on a on let's say uh, an isle on a mainland. Okay, and out of that storm, three or four of those individuals on this population of a million flew away with the storm onto the new island, onto a random new island. Random storm came by, and that random storm picked up a few of these people, and they colonized a new island. Okay? That's a founder. They are founders, right? And you know what their effect is on this new island? Well, now what's going to happen is that the gene pool is going to be in this in the gene pool in the new population, aka the population on this island of the few that colonize this random island that the storm blew them onto. The gene pool in the new population is very, very likely, very likely to be different, likely different. Um, than the original population simply because you have much fewer individuals. You have a uh, lopsided effect that's going to be seen in this new colonized founders effect of genetic drift. And another very famous type of genetic drift is known as the bottleneck effect. I love these names because they're very, very intuitive. They make a lot of sense. The bottleneck effect, uh, not founders effects, but founder eff founders effect, bottleneck, uh, I did it again, bottleneck effect 
This is going to be another very simple to understand thing. What we're going to have is that the randomly, for some reason, the size of the population, what do you think is going to happen to the size of population in genetic drift? The size of the population, small population, right? Size of population drastically, drastically, okay, huge, huge effect. Size of population drastically declines due to the environment, okay, due to environment. So let's say instead of a storm that comes by and takes off a few individuals onto a new island in the founder's effect, let's say we have a storm that comes by and kills everybody except for a few individuals. Now what we have is what we would call a small surviving population. That small surviving population is likely going to have a quite different gene pool, likely um, has a different gene pool than what we originally had with all of the individuals present, than the original population. Just because of population dynamics, just because of pure chance, just because of probability, you decrease the size. Uh, I like to think of the bottleneck effect as a bottleneck. Imagine you have, you know, equally distributed M&Ms within a bottle, okay, full to the top, and you turn that bottle around and you shake out a few. What you've done when you turn the bottle upside down is a drastic decline in the uh, uh, population because I'm going to tell you that the new population is only those that fall out. Those M&Ms that fall out, you could very well have just three or four M&Ms and all three or four of them could be brown and thus you have a small surviving brown population that is completely different than that original multifaceted, multicolored population within the bottle before the bottleneck effect happened. Your textbook has great images on that scenario. And now the final uh, thing that we'll talk about in the hardy weinberg conditions, last absolute thing, is gene flow. We'll do this real quick on the top here. Gene flow is defined as the following. Gene flow is something that we don't want in a hardy weinberg situation because gene flow is the direct movement of alleles, and this is key here, between BTWN and big letters between populations. You are moving alleles. Do you think you're changing the allele frequency when you're moving alleles? Of course you are. People are leaving, people are going, people are coming, people are arriving. This is all done via migration events. And if you have migration of new individuals coming into a population or migration of a lot of people leaving a population, whenever you have a migration event, the individual themselves takes their alleles. Individual takes alleles with them to the new population. And by definition, if you're taking alleles with you to a new population, if you're moving between populations, you're going to end up with allele differences. There are going to be allele differences, thus frequency differences between populations because now you're going from island one to island two. Island two has a totally different gene pool, but you're representing island one's gene pool at island two via your migration, via your alleles representing themselves. These alleles are going to have differences, allele differences between populations. And one last thing I want you to ask yourself is how do these allele uh, differences happen? How do we see these differences? Well, that's simply because of the reduction in allele frequency frequency, okay? And this is a good idea to understand. This actually reduces allele uh, frequencies, allele frequency, where am I going with this? Oh, there it is. Allele frequency differences uh, between populations. Because you know what's happening? Even though island one, let's say, has a certain amount of gene pool and island two has another gene pool, well, what if you have people from island one moving over to island two at a high rate? If you're having all of these people migrating gene flow, having their genes flow to island two, you're going to end up having a mixture of one plus two. And when you have this mixture, you know what you're doing? You're reducing the allele differences, the allele frequency differences that were once present when you had an individual island one and an individual island two. Now you have this mixture of one plus two, thus you have a reduction in differences. When we combine alleles, we are going to be reducing the differences that are between the populations because of this migration event. And that covers our conditions of Hardy-Weinberg.